Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Great to see you. Understand that at Niagara Falls, an interesting ha thing happens during the spring every year. There's large blocks of ice that break free and float downstream toward the falls. And often in these large blocks of ice are frozen fish. Well, the seagulls have figured this out. So what the seagulls will do, here are these large blocks of ice floating down the river with, with uh, frozen fish in them. These seagulls will come swoop down, land on the blocks of ice, and just peck away uh, and have lunch as they're uh, floating down the river. And what they'll do, they'll peck away, and then when the block of ice gets right next to the falls, they'll spread their large wings, they'll fly back and, and repeat the process. However, some seagulls make a tragic mistake. They stand on the blocks of ice too long, and their claws get frozen into the ice. So when they come to the edge, they try to flap their wings, but the ice is too heavy and they're caught. They're stuck in that block of ice and they go over the falls to their death. Now, if we're not careful, we can become like those seagulls. It can happen when we refuse to confess our sins. There's something very dangerous and very deadly about, about holding on, clamping on, clawing into unconfessed sin. When we refuse to admit our sins, we're kind of like those stubborn old seagulls. We cling to the carcass of our past failures until we're trapped in guilt and, and frozen in shame and then we end up spending enormous amounts of emotional energy trying to hide our sin, making sure that nobody sees the skeletons in our closet. And so we exhaust ourselves holding up a mask. We kind of go through life with a mask, and uh, the mask looks adequate and self-sufficient, and, hey, I got this covered, so we go through life holding up a mask, fooling maybe everybody but God. And so we go through life saying to ourselves, you know, if, um, if people found out about my sinful past, they would reject me. Even close friends, even family members, if they knew about my hidden sins, they wouldn't have anything to do with me. And so we go through life saying, I can't let anybody see the skeletons in my closet. Now, this is where step number five comes to the rescue. Well, welcome back to Freedom's Road. In this series each week, we're learning from the Christian 12 steps that are deeply rooted in the truth of God's word. We're learning how these steps can, step by step, lead us to freedom really loosening up our claws and getting free from the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that we have had in our lives. Now, step number five, it's a tough step. It takes a lot of courage. Here's step number five. We admit it to God, to ourselves, and to, one, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Now, the Bible can summarize step number five with one biblical word, confession, confession. Today, we are going to look at the life of a political leader who was caught up in a sex scandal. His personal life, his political career were in jeopardy. If uh, the secret discretion in his life ever leaked out, uh, he could be ruined 
forever as a politician. And so this guy faced an enormously difficult decision. And here it was. Do I tell the press I never had sex with that woman and hope the scandal will go away? Or do I go public and hope that my constituents will forgive me? Now, of course, the political leader I'm speaking of was King David. Who were you thinking? (laughs) King David, the great ruler of Israel, the great shepherd of God's chosen people. Most of you in this room know the story of his ugly skeleton, recorded in 2 Samuel 11. Most of you will remember his one night stand with his next door neighbor, Bathsheba, who ends up pregnant. Most of us remember his Watergate style cover up as he attempted to get her husband, Uriah, off the battlefield into the bedroom to cover his sin. That didn't work. Then we remember his insane plot that results in the murder of Uriah and the death of several of his men in his own army. And then who could ever forget the end of the story, the confrontation by the prophet Nathan, who came eyeball to eyeball with the great king of Israel and said to David, you're the man. You're the man. Now many scholars believe that these events provide the backdrop for the writing of Psalm 32. If you want to follow along today, we're going to be in Psalm 32. In this psalm, we're going to walk with David through the gut-wrenching experience of sin and cover up and, praise God, eventually confession. We're going to experience with David the paralyzing consequences of unconfessed sin. And later, we're going to experience the liberating joy and and the forgiveness that David experienced in his life. So in Psalm 32, David is going to invite us to join him as, believe it or not, good old King David takes step number five. He's going to admit to God, to himself, and to another human being the exact nature of his wrong. All right, what does that look like to you and me? You ready? Number one. Number one, admit your sin to God. There's a great place to start with God. That's where David starts. Listen to Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Ooh, remember that word, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, Now here's the end. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Notice he didn't just forgive his sin. He forgave what? The guilt. The guilt could be removed. Admit your sin to God. Admitting your sin to God was not easy for David, nor will it be easy for us. David's response, kind of like ours, was to try to hide that sin. He went to great lengths to cover his tracks. How often do we do the same? Who, me? Closet? What closet? I don't have a closet. If I don't have a closet, surely I don't have any skeletons in my closet. And so we cover and we deny. When I read those verses, could anyone identify with the painful consequences David experienced in this cover-up? I counted four things David endured. Number one, Physical illness. He physically got ill. God only knows how many people are in our hospitals today. And the root cause 
is guilt and the stress of that and trying to cover everything over. Physical illness. A depression. Number two was depression. And it was a depression that would not lift. It would not go away. Number three, there was a heaviness. David said a heaviness. Day and night, your hand was heavy. God, God loved him too much to let him get away with it. So God wouldn't let him up. And number four, physical and emotional exhaustion. He said, my, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Now, guys, we all know this routine. We know how it works in our culture today. We are taught from a very young age that you present an image of adequacy, okay, of perfection. Hey, I'm cool. I've got this. I don't need any help. We learn that from a very early age. So then when we do fail to measure up, we're not allowed to just admit it. So we have to put on the mask. We have to cover our failures and we wear the mask of denial or rationalization or blame. It took me a long time to learn this, but I put it in your notes. Holding up the mask of perfection takes enormous emotional energy. Enormous emotional energy. It's just amazing. And what will happen is finally that pressure will build to a point of emotional and, and physical exhaustion. You as a human being, you are not wired to carry guilt. You're not wired to carry that kind of shame in your life. And so when you, when you keep that guilt and when you keep that shame inside, guess what? It messes with your insides. Big time. Now, I know it's difficult but in a way, it's very simple. Step number five simply says this. Don't cover up, fess up. So think about that. Don't cover up, fess up. Whenever you sin, whenever you blow it, whenever you fail, just go, don't cover up, fess up to God. Just be honest with God. And instead of keeping it in, let it out in confession. Instead of covering up, fess up. Okay? All right. Now, that, David's not done with us, though. Something else he learned. Not only do you admit your sin to God, but numbered... Oh, you know what? I want to read 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Barry quoted it earlier, but here it is, so you can see that Barry really was quoting Scripture. <laughs> Look at this promise. If we claim to be without sin... You see that? If we wear the mask, we deceive ourselves... And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a promise. What a promise. That's called admitting your sin to God and he will cover it. All right, now we're ready for step number two. Admit your sin to yourself. And that's hard because if we don't want to admit it, the Word of God just said we deceive ourselves. We trick ourselves. We play games with ourselves. Not David in Psalm 32, verses 6 and 7. Listen to what he says. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Now look at this next one. You, this is his prayer to God. God, you are my hiding place. Do you see what David is doing? He's saying, God, I'm a sinner. I need, I need a place to hide. You're my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Now, if you remember the story, David finally confessed his sin to himself when the prophet Nathan confronted him. Remember 2 Samuel 12, 13? Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know what you call that? Admitting it to yourself. I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan, the prophet, replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. By the way, that's, you want the prophet to say that. 
You know, he could have, God could have done one of those Ananias and Sapphira things. Boom! Could have dropped him dead. He certainly deserved it. But Nathan said, your sin is forgiven and you're not going to die. We can see why David refers to God as my hiding place. We can see why David in Psalm 32 can sing songs of deliverance about God. Why? Because David finally got honest with God and honest with himself, looked in the mirror and said, I have sinned against the Lord. I realize it's hard for some of us to admit our faults and our failures, especially to that person we look at in the mirror. But we need to understand that confessing your sin to yourself, that's what opens the prison door to freedom. As long as you hold it in and, and deceive yourself and trick yourself and play games with yourself, you know, y'all with me here? You know the games you play? Oh, I can quit anytime I want. I just don't want. Hey, I deserve this. After the way I got treated, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know I've been fired eight times, but it's that boss's fault every time. Yeah. You with me? Do I need to go on? I've been divorced eight times. I just can't find the right person. Really? Look in the mirror. Have you dealt with yourself? Admitting your sin to yourself is a wonderful thing because you don't waste time and energy denying, covering, rationalizing, and blaming. You just blah, get it out and say, God, I blew it. You say to yourself, hey, self, you blew it. And you confess it, and it's forgiven, and then you move on. You let God forgive you, you let you forgive you, and then you move on. So, real simple, step number five says don't cover up, fess up. You fess up to God, you fess up to who? Yourself. David's not done, so neither are we. There's the third step. You need to, number three, admit your sin to another person. Now, why is it important to confess our sin to another human being? I mean, come on, isn't it good enough to admit our faults to God and to ourselves? Besides, it would be so embarrassing to admit to another person our faults and our failures. And yet, may we follow the example of David again. Psalm 32, we left off in verse 8. Here's what he says. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Now, who's the you? I'm looking at you. You're the you who, you're you who. You're the you who David was talking to. <laughs> He's talking to people. He's talking to fellow human beings, fellow sinners. And he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. In other words, don't do what I did, try to cover it up and make a mess. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright, where? In heart, yeah, you, get, you have a clean heart before God. What an amazing psalm. David, you see, not only confessed his sin to the prophet Nathan, he admitted his sin to the whole world. And ironically, to us, 3,000 years later, David is still confessing his sin to other people. His desire, you see, was to instruct and teach he doesn't want us to go the wrong way. He wants to teach and instruct us where? In the right way. In the right way, which is don't cover up, fess up. Keep short accounts with God. Why is it so important to confess to another person? Let me give you a, a few ideas here. Number one, here's the reason you need to confess to other people. Number one, it's biblical. Did you know that? It, it's biblical. 
Uh, James 5.16, listen to this. Therefore, confess your sins to who? Each other. You got any each others in here? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Maybe that's the reason you confess, so you can have somebody praying for you, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, we confess to one another so we can pray for one another and be healed. Number two, accountability. Confessing to another person really reinforces accountability. You know, you, you can't deny anymore. You can't rationalize. You've got to be honest with your friend. Number three, I love this one, you discover you're not alone. You ever been in a room where somebody tells their story, their testimony, and it's like once that person tells their story, it kind of loosens everybody else up. It's kind of like a shot of WD-40. It just kind of loosens people up who've been all uptight. And all of a sudden, those people don't say, well, I'm sure glad I'm not a sinner like you. No, we know what happens. When somebody opens their heart, it tends to make ours start opening up. And we say, yeah, I'm a sinner too. Number four, you hear words of forgiveness. Very, I didn't understand this early in my ministry, the, the importance of words, the, the importance of this word. Listen carefully. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. I didn't understand the importance of, of saying those words. Do you realize, this may shock some of you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a priest of God. You're a priest. Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, addresses Christians, says, you are a holy priesthood. You're a holy priesthood. Do you realize what that means? This may shock you. But you have, as a believer in Christ, you have the responsibility, the privilege, and the authority to pronounce forgiveness over your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's true. I'll put a couple of scriptures where my mouth is. 1 John 4, 12. Fascinating verse. No one has ever seen God. Is that correct? Y'all buy that? No one has ever seen God. But, but, if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete, where? In us. Do you understand that, that you are God's representative on earth? People can't see God, but they can see you, and they can see God where? In you. In you. Now hold that thought and look at John 20, 23. This one blows your mind. If you, anybody want to guess who the you is here? It's you who the word of God is speaking to. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That kind of sends chills down my back. Do you realize that as a, as a representative, as a holy priest of Almighty God on planet Earth, you have the right, the responsibility, and the authority that when someone comes to you, a fellow brother or sister in Christ, when they come to you and they confess their sin, listen carefully, you are to respond in this way. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. I didn't understand this early in my life. But I have seen speaking those words over people can make all the difference in the world. I've had people come in my office and confess their sin. Genuinely heartfelt confession. And I've looked them in the eye and I've said, as a representative of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. 
Guys, I cannot tell you, you would have to be there. But it is as if weight falls off the shoulders. I have to, I have to get the custodian in with a high-powered shop vac to suck the guilt up off my carpet. It's like people come into the room like this, and they leave like this. The, the weight of sin, the weight of guilt has been left. And I've seen that it happens. Guys, the, never underestimate the power of words. And with the words, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Weight is lifted. Chains are broken. Hearts are set free. So you, they hear the words of forgiveness. Here's another one. You experience closure. When somebody speaks those words over you, it's like, okay. Close that door, move on. And there's an enormous closure so that you can move on in the freedom and forgiveness of Christ. So, again, real simple, what does step five say? Don't cover up, what? Fess up. Don't cover up, fess up, in this situation, to another person. So one day, um, a little boy and his sister were visiting grandparents, and the little boy was given his very first slingshot. He went out into the woods and practiced his slingshot. Poor kid couldn't hit anything. Horrible shot. He finally gave up, walked back into Grandma's backyard, and as he walked in, he just happened to spy Grandma's pet duck. And just on impulse, he took aim and let the stone fly, and for the first time all day, you guessed it, he finally hit his target. Hit the duck, killed the duck. Well, he panicked. He grabbed the dead duck and he hid it in the wood pile. But he noticed his sister Sally was watching. Sally had seen it all, but she didn't say anything. Well, after lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, come help me wash the dishes. But Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to wash the dishes. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered, remember the duck. All week long, Johnny did the chores because Sally continued to threaten him, remember the duck. Finally, at the end of the week, Johnny couldn't stand the guilt any longer. So he went into grandma and he confessed what he had done, that he'd killed her pet duck. His grandma said, oh, Johnny, I know. I've known all week. I was standing at the window. I saw the whole thing happen. I was just wondering how long you were going to let Sally make a slave of you. So today I wonder, how much longer are you going to let Satan make a slave of you? How much longer will you allow the guilt of past sin to control you, to enslave you, to rob you of God's liberating freedom and forgiveness? Why not stop the cover-up today? February 10th, 2019. That's a good day. Today. How about putting an end to the cover-up today? It can happen if you have courage. Enough courage to take step number five. Admit to God, to yourself, and another human being the exact nature of your wrong. So instead of trying to cover up, fess up. And then let the blood of Jesus cover up the sin. Do this, my friend, and you will have taken step five on freedom's road. Let's bow. Well, Lord, thank you for telling the, the, the whole story, good, bad, and ugly, of King David's sin. Thank you that he was willing to write about it in such a vulnerable and transparent way in Psalm 32 and also in Psalm 51. Um, God, may we learn from his example 
David said he wanted to teach us so that we would make the right choice, that we would uh, fess up instead of cover up. So Lord, before we leave this room, we just confess that we're all sinners. You know our heart, you know our sin. Uh, You saw the whole thing. But thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus is able to cover up anything we confess up. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you that your blood is adequate. Forgive us for trying futilely to cover up our own sin. Thank you that you can adequately and then some cover any sin we bring to the cross. So Lord, today, nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. We pray it through Christ. Amen.